When military police arrived at the McDonald home early on the morning of February 17th, they found the captain sprawled on a bedroom floor. His wife, who had been expecting a child, lay dead beside him. She it was one of the most up. sensational Children murders of its time. In the early morning hours of February 17, 1970, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Colette McDonald, four months pregnant, and her daughters Kimberly, age five, and Kristen, age two, were savagely beaten and stabbed to death. During this attack, I suffered uh, approximately 19 stab wounds, including one which collapsed my right lung. Husband and father, Jeffrey McDonald, was severely injured as well. McDonald told a bizarre story. Three young men and a woman had attacked the family for no apparent reason. But suspicion quickly focused on Jeffrey McDonald as the killer, a handsome Princeton-educated Green Beret captain and emergency room doctor. McDonald has always said he is innocent, but he was convicted and given multiple life sentences. Your story doesn't ring true. I've studied a lot of crime scenes, and there's something wrong with this one. The story was detailed in the popular 1984 NBC miniseries, Fatal Vision. Well, what are you trying to say? This was a staged scene. You mean I staged the scene? I think so. It was based on the book by Joe McGinnis. Have you agreed upon the verdict in this case? Yes, sir. And left little doubt that Jeffrey McDonald had killed his family without remorse. Guilty. And yet... I believe him to be innocent. You do believe him to be yes, innocent? Yes, I do, because no one has ever showed me any kind of convincing argument for his guilt. They just simply have not. This case has been on my mind now for probably over 20 years. And the fact that this man has taken up McDonald's cause is significant. He is Errol Morris, Academy Award-winning documentarian, winner of the MacArthur Genius Grant, and someone known for challenging what appears to be the truth. Once you create a story, a narrative, and let's say it's a compelling narrative. It may not be a true narrative, but it's a believable narrative. It may be difficult or impossible to shed it. What happens when all the fingers are really pointing at you, saying you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty? Morris knows all about that. His 1988 film, The Thin Blue Line, is credited with helping free Randall Dale Adams, a man who was wrongly convicted of murdering a police officer. It's like a bad dream. You want to wake up, but you can't do it. Morris even got Adams' accuser to confess he'd framed an innocent man. Well, what do you think about whether or not he's innocent? I'm sure he is. How can you be sure? I'm the one that knows. It seems like you just had this passion for maybe going after stories that are hard. I like hard stories. I like digging. Maybe I'm one of those people that's always turning over a rock and looking at what's underneath. We were wrong, but we had in our minds a mindset. He turned his lens on the powerful in the fog of war, his Oscar-winning portrait of Vietnam-era Defense Secretary Robert McNamara. Well, we're here to put Caesar in the ground today, and I... And he embraced the oddball in his provocative examination of pet cemeteries, Gates of Heaven. And if Morris courts the image of an eccentric, don't be fooled. And how many commercials have you made over the years? Uh, maybe a thousand commercials. And he is the hard-driving director of commercials. If we all learn to pull our weight. For everything from Miller Beer to Nike Shoes. Let me see it. Seems like it should be shorter, doesn't it? All this allows Morris to fund projects dear to his heart like his multi-year study of the Jeffrey McDonald case, now a 500-page book, A Wilderness of Error.
This is a story where the defense was forced to play with a deck of cards where m most of the cards had been withheld. It was just simply unfair. McDonald has always maintained that four hippies entered his home, enacting what seemed to be a copycat version of the Manson family murders, a series of grisly killings that took place in California just a few months earlier. Errol Morris says that explanation proved to be too far-fetched for investigators who failed to preserve evidence that could have supported McDonald. You write that there were something like 27 different people traipsing through the crime scene? Yes. Furniture moved? Yes. Young, inexperienced investigators? Yes. Kind of a recipe for disaster, I guess, huh? The way you describe it. Yes. Um, yes, 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 and yes. In his narrative, Morris focuses on one person whose story actually backs up McDonald's account. Captain Jeffrey McDonald should be freed once and for all and not to have to go through all of what he's been going through for the last several years. Her name was Helena Stokely, a well-known drug user and sometime police informant in the Fort Bragg area. Until her death in 1983, Stokely repeatedly confessed that she and friends were in the McDonald house the night of the murders, including during this CBS News interview. I walked into the master bedroom. While Dr. McDonald was unconscious? Yes. What did you see when you walked in? Collette was sleeping on the bed. In fact, one military police officer actually spotted a woman matching Stokely's description near the crime scene on the night of the murders. Yet when Helena Stokely testified at McDonald's trial... The case hinges on this woman's testimony, what she's going to say on the stand, and suddenly she can't remember anything. She becomes a blank slate. It's one of the great mysteries of the McDonald case. But years later, an important witness offered an explanation for why Stokely changed her story that one critical time. A guy comes forward, a federal marshal, and says, I was there. And the prosecutor threatened her and told her essentially to change her story or he would indict her for murder. Why'd this guy wait so long to come forward? I take him at his word that it had bothered him over the years and that he felt that he should say something. Last summer, to this day, the prosecution summer, denies that there was any threat to Helena Stokely, but the claim is part of McDonald's latest appeal, scheduled to be heard this month in federal court. He'll also ask the court to consider DNA evidence that was not available at the time of his trial. They did find hair under the fingernails of one of the girls that could not be sourced to anybody in the house. No one in the family. That's correct. Not Jeffrey McDonald. Not Jeffrey McDonald. And though Errol Morris is confident of his conclusion that Jeffrey McDonald was railroaded, he's ready to face some fire. This could be very controversial. Are you looking forward to that? or I dread it, and yet I look forward to it in this sense. What happened here was wrong. It was wrong. It's wrong to convict a man under these circumstances. And if I can help correct that, I will be a happy camper. But author Joe McGinnis says he stands by his judgment that McDonald is guilty. And the Justice Department still insists the right man was convicted. Jeffrey McDonald has been in jail for 30 years.